And, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 55 of Global Citizens. My name is Kelvin. I am the show's host, and of course, I'm also its creator. So my guest for today is Mr. Nima Ashom. Now, just a little bit of background with Mr. Nima, yeah? So if you guys uh, have actually watched or read Marvel comics, uh, the late Stanley used to say, we are not born to fit in, but we are born to stand out. I think and Nima is actually somebody who specialized in it. He is a coach who, uh, who leads a group of unique individuals called the Outliers, Pioneers, and Mavericks. He is actually currently living in Singapore, even though he's originally from the United States. And he is a soon-to-be father, by the way. So uh, I will give the platform to Nima for now to introduce himself. So hi, Nima. Welcome to the show. How are you feeling? Calvin, I'm feeling really, really wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for so much for uh, this extending the invitation to be in this conversation with you here. I'm really excited for what comes of it all. Um, hi, everyone. The feeling spiritual. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Niyama Ashong. Uh, I am living in, in Singapore. Uh, I spent several years beforehand, basically my entire life, living in the US. And uh, now I do get the chance to spend my time really working with people on the things that make them different. And essentially the way I like to look at it is like, how can I help people use what makes them different in order to make a difference? I know that like global citizens, we see things from a lot of different perspectives and such. So to be able to bring all that out into the world in a way that can really continue to serve, uh, I got to spend my time coaching individuals, bringing together community around that and really just uh, helping the champion, the leaders who are going to shape the next era of humanity. It's a good time. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah, this is actually a lot of uncertainty in our times. So uh, it is good that we actually have platforms like yourself that actually do, pro did, do provide guidance and coaching in order for us to proceed to the next step. Yeah. So I actually am curious about this is that what was the determining factor that puts you on this career as a transformational catalyst? And do you have a particular eureka moment like maybe you feel that you know you have made a difference in your career. Yeah, I, I appreciate that there. The, the term transformational catalyst, uh, it really resonates. I, I, if I'm gonna be really honest, I, I believe that the, the defining moment for me actually started out when I was still in New York City. And uh, at that point I was working at a tech company and supporting the leaders of different uh, affinity groups, different diversity and inclusion related groups uh, in the organization. And uh, it's it's really interesting, Calvin, but my entire, my entire life, I've been running away from a label of being considered black. And it was just something that I just didn't think, I, I felt it as a limiter. And I had found different ways to, to dodge it and to actually just go, go forth and say, that's not me. In fact, you're talking to me right now. My name's Niyama Ashong. I say that with a lot of pride, knowing that for 20 years, I went by the nickname of Nemo Ashong. And so- Oh, my apologies. No, <laughs> My apologies no, this, for saying is, that because no. I heard it from you. It, it, the thing is, the thing is like, I am Niyama now, right? But like, yeah. but like there, there is, you talk about the, that transformational catalyst, catalyst moment. Uh, yeah. You know, it was it, it wasn't in the name change that was there, but it was it was just in the life that I had lived and the life that I lived that was uh, allowing me to be able to be accepted and to be um, able to be a person who is different in spaces that wouldn't that on the surface wouldn't necessarily invite me in. The way I look at it is like I was the exception to the rule and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Like that was I enjoyed being different. I knew I couldn't fit in, so I chose to fit out and to be a part of everyone from that perspective. But what ended up leading down the path of me, rather than me just staying in tech or continuing my career down that path, um, was that I ended up watching a video. Uh, it was during the Diversity in Black History Month in America. I ended up watching a video, it was called White Like Me. And at that time, it was the first time that I actually took in that there was systemic oppression and institutionalized racism in America. 
And all of a sudden, this idea of like, I'm the exception to the rule, uh, this fact that like, in everything that I had done, I was an, I was working as an actuarial consultant beforehand. I was I was an African American in in tech. In both of those environments, there was a statistic that said two to three percent of all people in this space in America are African American, and yet there I was. And I really feel like that in being in being confronted. I mean, like here goes the thing, Calvin. It's really it's not easy for me to say, but I feel like I became a black man at age thirty. You know. And being able to could be confronted with that at that age is something that like really helped me see I am here. I don't feel that different from anyone else in the world, especially not from anyone else that looks like me. And yet somehow I've been able to be here. So how can I go and create more space for the 97 to 98% of people who might have wanted this even more than me, might have worked even harder than I am, uh, and, this, and just the space or opportunity wasn't there. Um, and so that's that's really what took me and started me down this journey of saying, how can I actually use the fact that I'm in these spaces, that I'm in uh, spaces with people who are predominantly not like me, uh, at least in terms of a race perspective, right? Uh, and to be able to honor the differences that I bring to help create even more space along the way. Okay. A lot of times for, I actually learned this at, with one of my past guests. So mm -hmm. his name is Kevin Kota. So he's actually currently in Singapore now. He's a quite, he's a well-known global nomad. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we put walls around us. And the thing is, is that these walls is walls of comfort and conformity. Uh, purposely is that we created simulated fears in order for us to stay who we are, to justify who we are. So a lot of times, this is the one that actually helped us back and people can maybe i i'm we are fortunate enough we have movable limbs and everything but there are those who actually do not have such fortune and they use it as a strength do you what do you think actually is this determining factor in your heart or in your mind to start for somebody to break out of their shell for this And just to make sure I'm on the same page here, like this is breaking out of the shell in terms of being able to, to construct something that allows them to be able to navigate or to break out of the the, the structure that they've created to be able to navigate. Let me just make sure I'm getting the question properly. Correct. Yes, that is correct. Okay. And with I'll, I'll answer it based on, on I'll, I'll answer it this way. Um, what I've been finding for myself, so I I, I can I created a, const, uh, a construct for myself, right? Uh, that was the element of I'm gonna I'm gonna fit out. So in any, in everything that I did, um, I was looking to be the person who was able to keep my space by allowing by being the weirdest person, by being the most out there person, by by like it's almost like it's almost like this, Calvin. If I'm gonna be really real with you, it's like I didn't believe that that you would that you would accept me. So instead, what I did is I created this own little small little niche that I could like play in. And you're like, okay, well, this is this is what he does. Um, and honestly, for the last few years, there's been it's been this journey of being able to say, well, what if I didn't have to be that? What if I could simply belong? And so in the spirit of, I want to make sure I kept it real for myself here, in the spirit of that there and talking about that transition of really just getting to a place where where you can belong and not have to create external constructs for that to be. To me, the the number one element that has been that has played from all this here is really just allowing room for vulnerability and authenticity. And yep. vulnerability and authenticity being like having the courage to be you. And like if I don't say this early, it's gonna come off as just like way too much of like a cheerleading, go out there and be vulnerable, be authentic, you gotta be you. Uh, that's not me. Uh, like, if I'm gonna be real about it. It is some of the hardest work that I've ever had to do. You, there is a price, there's a cost that comes when, you, when you're afraid of actually being seen, being visible, being, if you're afraid that you won't be accepted, that you might be rejected, not because of anything about you, but if they actually saw who you were, like all of it could be lost. And I, so I say, I say that really like with a lot of heart 
when I when I talk about vulnerability, being authentic, being honest with yourself and being willing to be courageous enough to let other people see and hear and witness you as you truly are. Sure. Does that answer okay. your question? Let me make sure that that that, that covers it. Does. It. It, does. Yeah. it does. Okay. So being a third culture kid, earlier I think you mentioned a portion of it. So uh, is that for us as global citizens, we see things differently. Being a third culture kid uh, for myself and one of the person who actually live alike here, uh, his name is Mr. Ben Vogel, he's a good friend of mine. Mm. So uh, being a third culture kid, being a global citizen, we tend to see the world outside of the box because we are we have lived our life outside of the box. We are not we are not put in a system, we are not put in a certain ethics or culture. In fact, we adapt that perspective and like for example, uh, for me, uh, Singapore has always been a home to me. It's a second home and Indonesia is where I'm currently at. It's also my birth country and my passport country. But I I love both my home, but I've never regarded both of them as a home. Okay. So as a result, I do know how it feels like to be an outsider because when I do a certain things, it's everybody look at it like if there's a giant microscope and like magnify it. Oh my goodness, he did it. It's like, I don't know, when the last time I spoke Mandarin, everybody was like, oh, you can speak Chinese? I'm like, guys, I've been speaking like this the whole time. So I do know how it feels like. And it took me quite a while to actually accept my difference because I actually just, as I got older, I realized, oh, you know what? No, but uh, who, why do I care if people think I'm different? Because me standing out is actually good because it actually attracts attention. So it's it's how I actually use that attention in the most positive positive way. But there are those who actually there are those who actually dislike being different. There are those who want to stay who they are. What would you actually advise on that? Do you think that the, do you feel that this is they are wrong with that, or they actually just need their time to actually understand the impact that they can actually bring to this world? Yeah, I think that's my, my gut reaction on this here is like, I don't believe there's, I, I choose to not go go through life with the lens of right or wrong. Uh, it is it's yeah. just my space. I feel like everyone, everyone has their process. I'm still, you're still catching me very much in the middle of my process. I mean, I, I told you it was 30, it took me 30 years to become a black man, right? Uh, my name changed from Nemo to Niyama. I was born with the name Niyama and I adopted the name Nemo for 20 years, right? It wasn't until six months ago that I went back to my birth name. And I recently just made a post that, that came out there and said, I'm an angry black man, right? And that was yeah. like, like the fact that I'm I saying this right now. Friend. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, Actually, that's what the one that got my attention. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, like, to, it's so, Calvin, it's so wild to me that I just said that right now, because like, that is something that I, that I didn't want anyone to know. And now I've gone through, I, I had that experience, I shared it out in the world. And now I can share it out with people with global citizens everywhere and know that like I'm still in integrity, right? So yes. the, the, but like throughout my own journey, I didn't even I didn't realize time and time again, I didn't realize how much I like I wasn't able to accept different parts of who I was, right? And I and and for me, the elements of it had become in order to stay safe. Right. It, like it, in growing up in America, being a black man, it could there are, there are life or death consequences based on how people might might see you. And I think that I try to take a, a safe approach of like putting on the smile, making things like comfortable, so on and so forth. So this element here of. Is there a right way or is there like is there like a, a time that, that it should happen? I honestly don't have, have a direct answer to that my most the most real response that i can have is that like the world needs you the world needs what makes you you your experiences and the way that you see the world we we started out this conversation and acknowledging how much uncertainty there is right now we not we like there's uncertainty there's ambiguity and honestly in just even the last seven days has felt like its own distinct month for me. Like there's so much that's taken place. And what we're finding, at least for me, what I feel is like, like the way of the past, the way that the world was 
before you know January, February, March of 2020 is not how it's yeah. going to continue afterwards. And there are people out there that are like lost and not necessarily sure how to move forward. And what's the reason I fully believe in this here is that we need new paths going forward. We need new ways of connecting. We need your ability, Calvin, to be able to go into a brand new space, see what the culture is, be able to, uh, to be able to call out and navigate in that way so that we can continue to grow from there. So from my perspective, it's been, it's been really along those lines. It's like, that's, that's really been my, my feel on it all. All right, uh, we will now actually dive in with a little bit more on cultural difference here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I know you are actually American citizens. You yeah. are currently living in Singapore. But I don't think it's also not a secret, but you're actually a first generation American. Your family immigrated from Ghana, West Africa, yeah. yes. and to New York City, or was it New Jersey? I yeah. know you and your. You, you, yeah, you captured it. Like, uh, I was born in New York. I grew up in New Jersey in my last few years uh, before I came out to Singapore. We're in New York as well. All right. Okay. Oh, I think I'm okay. Okay. So tell us with a little bit more about how it's like with being this being culturally different. Because the thing is, is that uh, Singapore has been was my home for 15 years, but even then, uh, I actually don't ever feel that I've ever fit until the later years of my life. And even then, it's still a difficulty navigating through it. It's because I have a certain set of identity that I thought defined who I am. And then when I actually meet new individuals, I realize, huh, this is actually me. This is actually the different part of me. So for your case, how is it like? Because I believe that at home, your parents would have taught you the style of upbringing that they already have on what they grow up with. And then suddenly you are living in New York City, one of the most, one of the biggest melting pot of the world. And then suddenly you are you are now in Singapore, which is an incredibly outside of the United States already. So yeah, tell us a little bit more on your experience in dealing with ethnics and different culture. Yeah, that's really interesting. Can I can I answer this question from those three perspectives, like growing up Absolutely. in New York and then now in, here in Singapore? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's right. let's. It's taking me on a journey right now. Uh, from the growing up perspective, right? So what what comes through to me there is uh, my parents were quite amazing, and they they really spent time to make sure that I was able to be instilled with African values. And what is really but I was American, right? So everything around me was like the American influence, right? Um, and you know, there's there's that that feeling of like I had this conversation with my dad once, and he said to me, we were watching things on TV, uh, and there were some things, there were some people outside uh, of my house, and uh, we I grew up in the town right next to Camden, New Jersey, which was uh, one of the most dangerous cities in America at the time I was growing up, and I just remember my dad sitting me down one day and saying. Niyama, you are not like the people that, uh, like like everyone here, right? Like you might look like everyone, but you're African, right? And the difference there is that uh, like the people here have had, uh, the black Americans have had their history robbed from them. Uh, and they've had to be here in America and build uh, build their lives from there. You are, you are from Africa, you can trace your lineage all the way back. Um, and it was really, and it was in that spirit, that's, it was, it was something along those lines. And that's something that that's lived with me, you know, consciously and unconsciously for, for a while, just like, just that element of like, okay, wait, I see everyone, I look like you, but I'm not you. And it was done in a way to, to be able to say, you don't have to take on, um, like, uh, the examples that you see of black America and take that on as your own. And it really got me into a place of really identifying as an African American for most of my life. So that's uh, like that's why I say I didn't turn black until I was thirty. It was it was a different experience around that, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, when we get to New York, what what feels interesting about New York is that you're right. It's like such a melting pot. I think that there's two elements of that. In New York, I got a chance to just really just ex expand. Like. I couldn't be big enough. Like there's always something bigger. So I really got a chance to just like really play out and play to see the, the fullest extent of, or at least to try out the fullest extent for me. Um, 
and I now have a realization about my experience in New York that is colored by my experience in Singapore, which is that uh, I've always been, when I, when I was in New York, it felt like I was, um, it was a multicultural environment, the world that I was in, you know, I was in tech, I was in uh, a big four uh, consulting company. Like there was, I was surrounded by people from all over, but it was like, primarily it was like, uh, the way I would describe it is like, you're a French American, German American, you know, Chinese American, African American. Well, there's, that's, that's a continent, not a country, but um, it's this, this element of everything had that hyphen. Right. And so I was, I was around multiple cultures, but the hyphenated versions of that. Right. It's been interesting being out here in Singapore because in Singapore, I'm meeting people who are French, people who are German, you know, like, like it's, it, 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 there is no hyphen there in, in terms of the, the spheres that I'm in. And what's been really interesting has just been, and Calvin, I just gotta be very honest with you. Uh, what I didn't expect was as my lived experience here has gotten me a, a chance to see what it's like to live without the fear of life or death ca being carried with me because of the color of my skin. In Singapore, I'm American and that's that's it. And I, I feel like I'm really like, like at however other Americans would be, that's, that's where I sit. Um, and it's just a really, it, it's, I wanna be real with you about this here. I don't want to kind of like gloss over it. It's just, yeah. it's, it's something that's, I didn't know that life could feel this way. I like, it was, it wasn't anything that I had actually taken the time. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know, it's like a fish in water, right? You can't really, can you describe water if they've never been up to the surface? You, uh, can you describe like air? Can you describe like, it's just like, all they know is this, you know? Um, and so being in Singapore has been one of those experiences that's really given me a chance to say, like, oh, what might it be like? Like, this is what it, this is what it might be like if, if, I, if I was able to just navigate life as, as myself. When I was a kid, I used to say air smells like pollution since in Indonesia, the air is really dirty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's too much cars here. <laughs> So you get it, yeah. you, you get you get your your element yeah. of it all, right? When did when did you yeah. first like when did you first find a different way of like of experiencing air smelling a different way? Uh, actually, it was in Singapore. So I visited Singapore at that time when I was around six or seven years old. I can remember when. Yeah. So we were visiting my relatives then, and I realized that it's the different experience there, and it's something that I like. And years later, when I actually am a little bit older. I haven't even eaten my teenage years then, or even a preteen. I asked my parents, hey, can I study in Singapore? So, well, at first they were a bit reluctant. I'm an only son. So when I'm in Singapore at that time, I thought they, maybe they think that, oh, maybe in two or three years, he's just going to come back home. It's because at that time also there was a trend for parents to send their kids overseas because there was a lot of, well, uh, the economic was well at that time. And of course, there's a lot more open opportunities. Uh, I, they, they just don't expect that I will be there for 15 years of my life. <laughs> I practically spent a lot more of my time in Singapore as compared to Indonesia. So <clears throat> years later, when I actually come back, the air, okay, uh, this is the same air, but the environment at that time was different. So I actually have to learn to navigate it. In fact, it's not an easy process to the point that I actually created a show out of the need to actually have the sense that I still belong in a global world beyond, beyond what I actually have in a world that actually want to put me in a certain box. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Niyama. Um, I just want to say very quickly, I very much appreciate that. I like, I like, I'm, I'm taking that in and allowing that to, to impact me. Thank you for that. You're most welcome. Okay. So for those of you who has just tuned into the show for the very first time, and those who will be tuning in later, yeah, Global Citizens is a webcast that I actually created to host people who has experienced a multicultural lifestyle, such as myself and Yama, the life that we have actually experienced, such as just, uh, being a third culture kid, uh, an expatriate as a nomad, man. and of course, international speakers who we meet who are exposed to different parts of the world because of their job, their career. 
So why I actually created this is because I want people to actually see what it's like living there and visiting the country. Yes, you are exposed to new experience when you are visiting the place, but you are there only for a short while. Once you are back to your home country, you are back to the way it was. Whereas if you have lived there, you actually adapt this part of the world as who you are, as part of your identity. You left a piece of your heart in that country. So as a result, that place has attachment to you. And I'll give you guys one example. If I tell people that I'm from Indonesia, they will tell me, oh, I, I went to Bali. It's not the same, guys. Really, it's not the same. Bali is a built-in expat community. So it's not the same. It's not as in the beautiful part of Bali. It's the same in every single part of Indonesia. So I want people to actually see what is the difference. And I think Nyama has explored this part well, being as thank you so much for uh, sharing us all your three viewpoints as a West African, as a New Yorker, and then as a Singaporean now. Okay. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, we will actually move on to this. So I am, I've actually been writing an article recently on that deals with racism. So the three areas that I feel that could be tackled on is your home environment, the source of your information, and one of which is, I think, has, is actually recently is got known to the public, and you mentioned it earlier, <coughs> it's institutional racism or systemic racism, whereby uh, let's use the phrase done by a certain property mogul turned politician. It's all about location, location, location. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to say his name. I think you all know who that is, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm neither denying or neither am I confirming it. So with regards to this, yeah, how do you, what do you feel that having an environment that is a lot more accepting of different races is much, much better as compared to the one whereby it's more, seg it's more segregated for one? And two, how do you feel that to create a multiracial environment would be achieved? Yeah, I appreciate that. I think um, for me, the, the core elements of my experience here is, especially when I think about like uh, systemic racism in the person, like I'm I'm even still just building into this. Like I said, it's only been a few years since I've even acknowledged it, right? But I know that it has been in place uh, yeah. at least in America for generations beforehand, right? It's not it's not a new yeah. thing. It's not it's not about who's not about leadership. It's not it's 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 baked into uh baked into to the country. Um and so when I think about this um I want to I, would, I want to make sure I captured that part first and foremost. Um, you asked me a question, and in this current moment, I've forgotten. So, would you mind repeating the? Oh, the part yeah, sure. Respond to it real quick. Yeah. How do you feel though that people could? How would you feel that whether it's in the digital world or maybe in the real world that there could be a lot more acceptance of multiracial, of a multiracial environment? Because, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think I think. For me, it comes down to like this one simple principle that I have, which is it's I have a counterintuitive truth. I have a counterintuitive truth. And my counterintuitive tu truth is most people believe that the path to inclusion is by finding out all the things that we have in common. Yes. And for me, my belief is that it's actually about the true path to inclusion is, or let me rephrase that, the path to true inclusion is about celebrating and valuing the things that make us different. So rather than seeing how are you the same as I am, what do we have in common? How can I like, like there, there's an element there that it, that while it sounds good, like also adopts this, um, maybe unintentionally, but adopts this thing of, are you one of us? What do you have in common with me? 
do you fit in? Do you fit into the mold? Do you continue to continue where I'm at? And it sounds so good, Calvin. That's the part about this that's like so uh, counterintuitive. That's what people say. But what do we have in common? Let's find out what we have in common. And if we find out we don't have anything in common, then like, then, then where's the room for inclusion? For me, what I've found is that honestly, the one and only thing that every single because I, I was playing this out in my head. I was like, I'm like, how do you get to the core of inclusion? Like, how do you, how do we actually make this work? And as I played it out, I'm like, the one thing that every single person, all seven plus billion people on this earth have in common is that we're all different. That's the one thing we all have in common. And so if we're not able, like, if that was the case, then I was like, well, the if we're all different, how can we celebrate that? How can we go ahead and say like, okay, Calvin, you've had your experience in the world. You know, you've, you've like, you've lived in Singapore, you've lived in Indonesia, like all these different things. Now you like, you have your own platform. Like, wow. I would love to find out more about your experience. I'd love to find out more about what it is that you have to offer. How do you see the world in a way that's different than mine? How does your race, your culture, your like where you grew up, the experiences that you've had, how does that like inform the way that you see the world? And how can we use that to come up with new solutions to collaborate and create and co-create actually different things that, that I couldn't do on my own? I've learned so much about myself and about the world and about like just different opportunities that are available since moving to Singapore. What it's been, it's been such an amazing experience to be just surrounded by people who are different from me on a regular basis. It's just like, just even just being a part of the expat community gives me opportunity for that. And I think that like, to me, the, if we're able to get to a place where rather than saying, I don't see your difference or trying to see, well, I get that you're different, but let's try and find out how we're actually the same. And instead get to a place and be like, whoa, you're different. Awesome. Like, great. Because of that here, like we can go and create together. We can, we can find something new together. That to me is where like, I know I feel included. If someone comes to me and says, wow, I'm so happy you're here because you're a black man. Like that to me does not feel like an inclusive space. I'm like, you're not actually seeing me. You're just seeing. And that's not like, I'm not impressed. You know, I think that also, uh, sorry about that there. Uh, one of the video that you recently went live with, uh, which you have already mentioned earlier, Angry Black Men, that is actually based on racial stereotypes, right, of an African American as portrayed in a media. So, along with that is that uh, I actually do have a, one of my past guests, uh, when he actually met an African American, he really thought he needed to do some kind of weird handshakes. And at that time, of course, it was in the in the 80s so uh i think i'll give a pass on him for that not that i encourage it of course but at that time was because he barely know anything outside of his own his own home so with regards to that yeah uh maybe i let you continue again on what do you I'm feel is, in, yeah sorry I, i'm well no i like like i'm glad you brought that up because calvin i i like i'm of the belief that like you know, uh, there's an element of that that puts a smile on my face, you know? Um, and I also see that like, you know, there's another part of me that's like hurting, you know, like, like, like it's like, oh, you know, like, uh, but yeah. but there's a part of this here that is just, I really just want to acknowledge the humanity of it all, right? We're all in a place where we only know what we've been exposed to. We only know what we've been exposed to. And I think that at a certain point, we get to a place of realizing just how much we don't even know that we don't know. That's usually one of my yeah. big fears. I'm like, I'm like, all I know is that there's more going on in the world than I can ever really know. And I just feel, I feel that like, as the world becomes more global, I mean, we're talking to global citizens here. So like, I'm sure everyone here already feels this to some, to actually, I, I don't want to speak about what your feeling is. Um, but as, as global citizens, like we're going to, we're going to continue to expand our understanding of the world and of, of what of, of other people. And it's this element of, I think what's really coming out is like, are we willing to make mistakes? Are we willing to be courageous enough to go for a handshake or, or to voice that like, I think I'm supposed to have a handshake. Do I really know is this really it? And to be, to be able to stay in that um, experience, both as the person who's like, 
I'm not necessarily sure how to navigate as well as the person that is receiving them. I, I think right now we're in this space where we are getting a lot of different people with different opinions. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it right now in, in the U.S. where like, um, especially I have, a, I have a lot of white friends. And so there's, there feels like, like, how can I, how can we talk about the things that are happening with black people right now? Or should I really say something or, you know, I'm going to like, I just don't want to, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And for me, there's a part in there where it's like, no, I need you, I need you to actually use your voice. I need you to be willing to meet, to meet me. And chances are you might make a mistake and that's okay. Like we can course correct from there. We can do something with that. That's energy that's in here. Um, so like, when you talk about the handshake there, um, I think I think we're still having our equivalents of that. I think we're still building off a lot of what we think or what we know about people from far away. And you know, I've been really interested in seeing how can we bring people together and start getting them a lot closer to one another, so that like we're able to actually get past the that which we know on the surface, and be able to continue to actually dive deeper and deeper with one another. Oh. Okay, uh, I'm actually gonna ask you something that's quite interesting. Yeah. I'm giving you now the chance to be a management or an executive producer or a creator of a show or a creator. What would you create in order to address this kind of social issues? Oh, my friend, you actually, uh, I just had a conversation with someone about this here. Uh, I'm launching a series of conversation, possibility driven conversations, right? Uh, yeah. Right now. And uh, I'm working on the name of, of it still. It's something probably like America 2045 or Global 2045, something like that. But to give us a chance to look 25 years out into the future and see like, what is the world that we are creating? What is the world that we want to be living in? And how do we bring that into our life right now? So if I was creating a show on that, it would be something like that, uh, you know, global uh, 2045, possibility 2045, something along those lines to say, like, in the next 25 years, which is just a generation from now, right, we're all going to be 25 years older, right? The, the, the global makeup of the world is going to change. Our ability is to come together is going to change. And to be able to, um, if I was making a TV show, if I'm making a YouTube cha channel, I'm having interviews, you know? If I'm doing something on Zoom, I'm bringing together on conversation. If I had a TV show, it would be like life in 2045 and life that shows what all, like what might be available to us. I, I like the, the 2045, it's really appropriate right now because it's 25 years is enough time for us to make a lot of changes. Um, uh, 25 years, um, gives us a chance to be able to like not be not to feel the pressure right now we need to change it all right now but there's also significance in 2045 because uh projections like th th i've seen like studies and projections that say that uh in america uh the white people will be in the minority by by 2045 and so to me that that like entertains the possibility of a world of minorities you know, and my thing is like, how do we start working toward that such that when when that comes up, it's only 25 years from now, but it's all, it's 25 whole years away from now that uh, we're able to be in a space that where everyone actually uh, feels feels taken care of, regardless of, of who or who they are and what they look like. Um, and then from that place, you have to be able to use use this TV show to to demonstrate a what it could look like. B, how we how we're operating with one another and see all the fun antics that we get into when we don't have to worry about <laughs> the things that we're worrying about right now. All right. And okay. if anyone's interested in in creating this here, I know that you have a very powerful global citizens. Give me a call. Like I, I'm happy to take on the EP role uh, and, and help bring this all out to life. Uh, one of my future upcoming guests is actually a movie director. He, uh, he recently created a ship movie called The Shadow Play in Malaysia. He's also a TCK, by the way. So, yeah, <laughs> I'll let him know about this. Maybe there could be something. <laughs> yeah, I, I asked that I asked that intentionally. Like, I know I have a smile on my face, but I wasn't asking that, like, like facetiously. I know that the people who watch this are some of the most powerful people on this planet. They do very different things and they have different ways, like, but I recognize 
their skills and their individuality and in the way that they that they think. And I think about what it might be like if we can come together, the collective of it. So yeah, I'm tapping into that as well. I would love to, to go out and explore this. It's a lot closer. I feel like it's a lot closer than I than I uh, might imagine in this moment. So I'm, I'm leaving the space for that possibility as well. Okay. So why do you feel though is that, uh, okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so recently we have, we have encountered a lot, a lot of cases which, sorry, uh, world events is the more appropriate way to put it, whereby race comes into play. We, the recent corona epidemic, it was the Zeno, rise of the xenophobia on the Chinese and any other Asian one. And with, of course, the recent case of the death of Mr. George Floyd. So uh, as I would like to send a condolence to the family. So such a thing happened. It's such a tragedy. And I actually don't dare to look at the video when they actually showed about him being being choked by using the knee. Because I think it's just, it's just too gruesome to see that a human can do such a thing. To another human. Uh, my, what are your thoughts when you actually heard about this? And what do you, uh, yeah, Nyama, uh, what are your thoughts when you actually heard about this? Yeah. Um, now this one hits hard. I just want to make sure that I'm not, this is, this is where I might run away from an answer and I want to make sure I'm actually leaning in to it. So, <sighs> She goes the full story. I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've shared this with any anywhere else, but a few days, maybe about two weeks ago to the day, uh, I had a friend here in, in Singapore who sent me a message, uh, and a message just said like, Hey, I just want you want to let you know that I'm sorry to hear about Ahmed Aubrey and George Floyd. And at the time, I had no, I didn't know like who they were really. Um, and, but I had, I did have this response inside. I was just like, if someone is sending me a message to me privately, uh, and it has the name of two people on it in, who I assume, I, I assume that they are black people who have been targeted recently. Uh, and I responded, thanks. And I, but I hadn't really done any work on it. On uh, Friday, uh, I woke up and this is about, I guess, 10 days ago. So by the end of the week, I woke up at like 4.30 in the morning. I just couldn't go back to sleep. And so I was like, okay, let me go and take a walk. And during that walk, I was like, I want to, I want to make sure that like I'm honoring, uh, I'm honoring these names here. So I spent some time uh, really watching George Floyd and learning more about his story. And Calvin, I got angry. I got angry. I got sad. Um, I felt powerless. I did watch uh, the over nine minutes of, of the killing of George Floyd. I, and part of that was because I felt I needed to honor him in some way, like, like, on those last minutes. And I've never, ever watched anything like that before. Um, but it, 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 it's something that I just felt really called that, that I like, I need to honor this person because quite frankly, like it could have been me. Um, and it happens, it happens too often. And I'm now at the point in my life where I don't think I can turn the other, like turn the cheek or like, you know, turn aside and just be like, Oh, th this just happens. And like, the way that I see myself in the world and the way that like, you know, we talked about this earlier, I'm going to be a father later on. Like there's just, I, I'm at the stage in my life where I'm a player too. What, what I choose to involve in, what I choose to say, what I choose not to say, it makes a difference. Uh, and it may only make a difference to one other person, but it makes a difference. Um, and so I spent that morning, I spent a couple hours watching the videos and just really just feeling angst. And I came back and I was like, okay, well, what can I do? Maybe I'll do a, a, a nine minutes of silent protest. I'll come on Facebook and I just won't say anything for nine minutes. Uh, and I left, I was like, I don't think that's gonna be enough. Like, 
like I don't know if that's really going to say anything. So I just came back here and just and just got on Facebook Live and said, "Hey, shared shared the realness of the moment with me." Um, and then I did something I hadn't done before, which is like I'm like let I want to create a conversation. I want to create a space where people can come in and process, uh, process so we can move forward, but process so we can take action. Um, and it was interesting because it was like for me it was based on a an idea that I had in my that I got a chance to help bring to life in my my experience in a tech company called an open forum where people could, where it was brought on about us regarding a specific event, but we brought in the topic to allow for people to be able to share their experiences in whatever way made sense related to it. Um, so this one, while it was, it was invoked because of the killing of George Floyd, uh, we brought it into a topic of, called racism racism hyphen 20 during COVID hyphen 19, right? Racism 20 during COVID 19. Um, and brought together over 30 people to have just a really meaningful, honest, open conversation around their, not even, the way I use conversation is important. They got a chance to share, to voice, and to witness the lived experiences of racism for them. And the people who came in there was a glo global audience. Like the people that are in my world are globally conscious, socially conscious, uh, and impact driven people. And it was people from Singapore all the way to people in New York City. And we were all just sharing our own different experiences of racism, regardless of what that race was. Because I, I believe we all experience it in different ways. Um, and so that was, that was my initial reaction. And then we've talked a, a bit here I mean, it was it was it was a powerful experience. Um, the next day, I I felt like I needed to express what was on my heart, and that was the places where I was trying to hide still. Um, and that's when I came up with the uh, Facebook Live that was all about like like just it was just called "I'm an Angry Black Man." This one's for me. This was like yeah. my to be to be seen and to not hide in my anger. There, so that's like that was how that continued to. Uh, over the last few days, it's continued to grow. I mean, like, it, that's why I say it feels like the last week, it's felt like a month because the personal journey and such that's been going on has been tremendous. I gotta say this here because like, I, I asked you very deliberately to like, if we can name this this conversation, you are the leader you are looking for. And yeah. that, was, that was the realization that I got after watching that video, I'm like, we need to come together. Who's going to organize this? Who's going to do this here? And I had been spending so much of my life looking out for the role model, the leader, the example, the person who's going to bring me in until I realized that like, oh, wait, this is my turn. It's now my time to take all this and turn it into something. And that's really been like a really meaningful and important, important message. What keeps me going forward where it's like, wait a minute, if it is to be, it is up to me, as they say. I see you doing it with global citizens, and I see. I imagine a number of global citizens are out there are also being that, being that leader. But just if you're sitting there and you're not sure, or you're waiting, or you feel like there might be someone else out there that that has a solution, I'm going to invite you to remember that you are the leader that you're looking for. I actually have some final questions. So, uh, you are a soon to be father, yeah, and. You are a transformational catalyst. The next question is actually going to be a little bit play on the on this episode's title itself. You are the leader you are looking for. What kind of leader should people be in the future? Uh, the thing is, is that we discussed it earlier. There's this institutional racism that is done is because it's something based on profiteering. There's also racial stereotype in order to pander for uh, someone's sense of nationalism. And well, th there has been efforts to change it, but I'm not going to be tuning into a video whereby the representation of an Asian anytime soon is going to be without the women wearing a skimpy attire or somehow every single Chinese man knows Kung Fu. And of course, we discussed like one of the earlier that you mentioned is that, uh, which is the very title of your the recent Facebook Live video. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not comfortable saying that angry black part of it. 
So what do you think is what kind of advocacy or system could be done in order to make sure that the next generation, well, racism will never go away. That's the sad reality. But what do you think could be done for the next generation to be given the support or education in order to at least diminish this unnecessary, unfounded hatred and to diminish this in a larger, in a larger degree? Yeah, I'm, I'm still doing my work on that. I know, I know what I believe. And I think that there are a number of different organizations that have actually spent a lot of time researching and have dedicated themselves to civil and social justice uh, in, in local communities and, and beyond. So um, there's still more work that I am doing uh, from that perspective to, to see what are some of the practical on the ground uh, elements of it all, right? Right now, what I what I believe in is it really just comes back to that element of like, can we create space for people's differences? Can we create yeah. space to appreciate that? And there's a part of me, and I, I'm again, I'm still exploring this here. I'm like, I'm still, I'm I'm learning it, but I'm I'm owning my responsibility along the way. Of I already know enough to do something, and I'm going to continue to learn, right? Because there's 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 there's, on, there's always going to be more that I don't know than I than what I do. Um, but what comes for me is really being in a, in a place where, you know, even here, like we're willing to voice that, which is uncomfortable, right? I'm an angry black man. I hate seeing that. Like even just saying it in this moment, it's still like, I'm like, no, I don't want you to see me that way. Uh, and I can even feel I can imagine. I, as I said, I don't even want to see it. Even I don't yeah. want to see it. But this is the this is the this is the element here. Like I, I think that part of the path is for us really to call it out, for us to call out elements of institutionalized racism, systemic oppression, to 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 not let it passively go by. We're in a place right now where there's a lot of energy that is that is um, involved right Thank here you. that is actually bringing up and letting people be able to see see what the world actually looks like, right? Um, and giving people a voice to it all. I think that the big thing is like the voices can't end. And I have to call it out like, like there are people who have dedicated their lives to this. There are people who've done decades worth of work to do it. A lot of us, myself included, are coming in like now it's almost like an American football reference at like the one yard line and trying to, and being like, yeah, we scored a touchdown. It's like, there's actually been a lot of work to get up to this point. And there's gonna be a lot more work that's gonna come afterwards. So I feel that, um, for me, there's it's that it's that willingness to be involved for the long run, the willingness to voice what is what is what needs to be said, even and especially when it's uncomfortable. Because I ask myself, well, who does this serve? I typically nowadays I know that I don't I don't like to go on Facebook Lives unless I'm going to say something that makes me super uncomfortable, because it's in those spaces that like. It's not the words that I say, it's the practice that I have. The practice of, are you, am I willing to be vulnerable? Am I willing to be authentic? Am I willing to be genuine? Or am I gonna come out there and just start like putting myself in a position to be seen good? Or to be seen like, yeah, to be seen good. Let's just leave that as, as it is. Like there are, or am I gonna let myself really be seen as I truly, truly am? And that element of being able to be vulnerable, I think that vulnerability as we go forward for leadership in general, to be able to, to be real and to be human again, it's gonna be incredibly important. And we got a chance, I think, I think COVID-19 has given us a chance to really get back to what it means to be human, to reaching out to the, our loved ones, to, to finding different ways that we can collaborate, finding different ways that we can be innovative uh, together. And this element here is like, as we continue doing it, I just see at the core of it all, if we're gonna have a real opportunity of this year, it's it's a not it's in taking action when action is called for, and building out that making sure that the unwritten rules of our culture actually also support this. I think also, if I may add on, also is that we got to stop seeing people or their skin colors or uh, based on what we know about informations that might not be based on truth but it's more towards the sense of attractions because well 
uh, most of the sources that I mentioned is more towards, at the end of the day, it's for profits. So we got to see people for who they are, not what they are. Because the thing is, is that not everybody follow a certain character or somebody could have grown overseas and do not even understand that particular area. And as a result, you gave them an, un it's like you're giving somebody a death sentence before a trial. Yeah, uh, am I right to add that, Nyama? Again, I'm like whether it's right or wrong, I think I think uh, the that's that's less of the element for me. I think I think it's there's a part here of human. you being willing to express what's real for you, right? And to yeah. and to bring it into like even this way that we're having this conversation for me, like this is the this is the the key underlying element. I'm a meta person. I'm like I'm like. I love to help people learn how to learn, right? I like to help people have practice actually having real conversations. So even just being in this space here, like there'll be a time where or like we might come in and just like, uh, you know, try and see even further what, 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 what we're thinking. I think we're all coming from different perspectives here. I'm not trying to not have, a, have an opinion on it, but I'm far more interested in the way that our dialogue has a chance to come come forth the way that we are able to express be heard and go on from there i see things differently right i have a different world view than you do right but at the same time we're ultimately also still really aligned and i think that's why like i get excited you asked me about that ep and the tv show question i get excited about that because it's like if we can actually sit down and say and, and find out for ourselves what is the vision that we have for the future that is in alignment like all like how we get there or whatever it is like i feel like there's just so much more i, I feel like all the things are necessary we all there's so many different things that are necessary to change systems right to change ecosystems um and so from that place there i i'm far more interested in how we're having the conversation than the actual elements of it okay uh this is actually going to be the last question okay. what advices or books would you give to now uh somebody who is about to enter the world that they are going to the way the world is now uh, because maybe uh, well you're a you're going to be a father so i think this is something that's a lot more personal to you so a child who is about to graduate college or e-graduation i heard recently is because they can't even be inside the graduation hall so they are about to enter the real world and what they know in the past is that if from my own experience graduating from college is that life is not like school it's already at the first place it's already difficult but now the world is already changed it's going to change in a large degree now because now people realize what has always been working in the past might no longer work so yeah 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 um it's really interesting i i, I wish i had a book right now that comes to mind. I know that I've been doing, like reading a number of books. If you look at my Audible, there's, there's a number on there. There's no one book that right now feels like the, the right book. And I know that there's 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 books that are circulating right now about how to be anti-racist. Um, you know, there's there's books on right, white fragility. Um, but what, what comes up for me is less of a book uh, and more of a practice. I think that the the practice of uh, of investing in, in self, development and leadership development like that's that's really where i would put my attention um in terms of seeing how like how to be a great leader um especially when it comes to emerging technologies there's a, there's a book called emerging strategies that I, that uh that's been really that i really like um and there's another book called community the structure of belonging by peter block that um i've returned to many many times uh to see how can i start how can i bring together people to have to create a future that's distinct from the past to give us and which really helps me with the tools and the questions uh, to allow for that and then the last thing i'll say on this here is uh i'm a big proponent of change and of coaching and so i've, I've been finding that coaching allows us to be able to dive deeper uh, into what's real for us uh, and to be able to navigate uncertain paths it's like it's, it has that distinction from like let's say teaching in, in a way um I don't know if that's actually a true distinction, but it feels different for me. Uh, but it's in that element of being able to to have that personal development, that mindfulness uh, elements of it all, 
And if there was a book right now, the book that comes to mind is Community, The Structure of Belonging, because my focus is on how do I bring people together. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. And with that, that's all the time we have. This is the end of Global Citizens, episode 55. You are the leader you are looking for. So first off, I need to thank Yama for his time coming to the show today. And I also need to thank all of you who have tuned in. And I would definitely love to mention all these individuals who live a life and a heart emoji. First off is Keegan. Uh, this is him. So Keegan is actually a friend of mine. So uh, he is actually uh, biracial, actually. And he has been really proud of that since the first time I've met him. He's a really great guy. So we also have uh, Ms. Jocelyn Go, uh, Mr. Asabul Ali Khan, uh, ben, ben, Mr. Ben Vogel, and of course there's Lisa, who actually leave a comment. I uh, hope you enjoyed this show. Uh, so along with that, I'm actually creating an upcoming article from Medium. I'm currently proofreading it before it is going to be released in my Medium. So do look out for it and it will be dealing on racism with the title why do we hate how racism persisted in Vietnam. so uh, lastly i would like to thank niyama again for his time and also for his insight uh niyama you got anything you want to mention yeah just calvin i i really appreciate being on on uh, having this conversation i think it's important ones to have and the it's important to just be able to have this space. So thank you so much for that. I, I want to invite anyone um, to just reach out to me and to, to continue the conversation. Uh, there's some things that are going on. Maybe Calvin, I can share the links of some of the things that I'm doing right here. People are interested in Absolutely. coming in and Calvin, Cal, yeah. uh, conversation later on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've already attached your LinkedIn and your website in the description box. If you have anything you want to add on, just pass it to me. I'll put it in the description box so that you can reach out to me. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, I, I think it'd be really great to be. I would love to be in conversation uh, with, with anyone that, that's interested in happening. Okay. And with that, that's the end of Global Citizens. Uh, do take care of yourself, guys. Uh, for those in Singapore, hope you hope the circuit breaks and soon that you guys can go out. I know it's considered phase one ended, but come on. <laughs> there is still much change to it. Sorry about that. And yeah, uh, do take care of yourself, stay safe, uh, take care of your hygiene, and of course, treasure your family. And with that, we will go, we will end this podcast. Bye.